Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about antinatalism. The whole decision of procreation boils down to one thing. Suffering. That is, if you look through the lens of antinatalism. If I were to propose this question to you, you have two ways of dealing with a problem. Would you rather act early and prevent the problem from arising, or would you rather face the problem and try to solve it once it is actualized? Most of us would choose the first option, given the phrasing of this specific statement. But antinatalists argue that humans usually choose the latter. They say life is suffering, and in fact there is more suffering than pleasure in life. Thus, they argue, it is morally wrong to bring life into existence. Now, <clears throat> in the words of David Benatar, parents will do almost anything in their power to minimize the amount of suffering their child might experience in the world. Everything except for not bringing them into existence, which would ensure they never experience suffering at all. This brings us to the asymmetry argument proposed by David Benatar. He is a leading thinker on antinatalism. Now, he suggests that there are two types of people. Those who are born and alive and live amongst us, and those who are not yet born. There are two factors in this equation, pleasure and pain. For people who are born and experience life, they experience pleasure, which is good. But they also experience pain, which is bad. Now, for people who are not born, they do not experience pain, which is good as it is the absence of suffering. However, they also do not experience pleasure, which Benita argues is neither bad nor good, but neutral. For something to be considered good, someone has to be there to experience it. Since no one is there to experience the pleasure, it is neutral, and the absence of suffering is then always good. This equation leaves us with an asymmetry, which according to this line of thinking, makes people who are not born yet better off than people who are born. Now the problem with this line of thinking, and you're welcome to disagree with me, is that there is an arbitrary nature to the points being allocated in this system. What I mean by this is that Benatar could decide, or is of the opinion, that it is better never to have been, with the framework of pleasure, pain, being, and not being already set up. He can now work backwards from his conclusion and just tweak the numbers until the model works in his favor. In this model, pleasure is plus one and suffering is minus one. But if I were to make pleasure plus two, his model wouldn't work anymore. The problem with this reasoning might come from people see pleasure and pain differently, quite subjectively. But he says that pleasure and pain are not subjective. And in terms of his value system that he proposes, it is quite objective. If I were to propose this hypothetical, I would ask, would you endure five minutes of the most intense pain possible if I give you five minutes of the most intense pleasure possible in return? Now, most people would say, no, it's not worth it. The pleasure is not worth the pain, and they would rather remain neutral and receive neither. Um, because the pain in this value terms outweighs the value of pleasure. Now, it might be that we see life as intrinsically good. Well, why not, you ask? It's not that I see life as not good, but that I have no other choice to see it this way. I have to see life as good. It's the same with the free will problem. Even the most deterministic people behave as if they have free will, even though they say they don't. Evolution, evolutionarily, I am inclined to believe and act as if life and sentient beings are intrinsically good. The same way that even if free will doesn't exist, we can't really act otherwise, regardless of whether it is true or not. So let's say you have two genes. One gene wants to live and procreate, and the other gene doesn't want to live and procreate. The reasons for why they do what they do aren't really important in this scenario. The only thing that is important is that one wants to live and the other doesn't. This is evolution. It creates all the possible variants of genes. It's not about one being correct and the other being incorrect, but just are. Now this deconstruction of truth um, can make us very skepti skeptical about what we consider right and wrong. So all the beings that are alive today are genes that wanted to live, genes that believed life is intrinsically good. This doesn't necessarily make them right. 
And all the other genes that died off, remember, this doesn't necessarily make them wrong, you know, don't exist anymore. So when we, when we say we want to have kids, is it you talking or is it the billions of years of genes packed into your body that is speaking? Now, when I first encountered the idea of antinatalism, my initial reaction was that it is obviously a crazy idea. Just a bunch of resentful, depressed people came up with it. And don't get me wrong, it, it still might be. Um, but one of my biggest, biggest sins in life is that I can never choose a side. Um, I sometimes do, but I'm so dedicated to understanding both sides of the argument that I back myself into a corner. Now, I, I've read a few books on this. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I don't just you know, suck all of these ideas out of my thumb. But if you're a happy person, I wouldn't recommend reading, reading these books. You know, this one, uh, this book, <coughs> The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by uh, Thomas Ligotti. A very nice cover, by the way. Um, it's a very depressing book. And I've also read David Benatar's Never to Have Been, which is a bit more technical. And uh, also Peter Vessel Zafas, The Last Messiah. All of these dealing with um, antinatalism and why, why should we keep living? Or why should we procreate? So what, what am I getting at? Well, I read everything. I understood everything. But they still couldn't sway me from my, let's say, pro-life decision. After all the reading and pondering, I sat down and scrolled through Instagram. And as luck would have it, the first video I saw was of a little girl and her parents. She had just been approved for a lung transplant. Both the parents and the girl had tears of joy. And keep in mind, this little girl was only like five years old. The only thing I could think was that if she had never been born, she wouldn't have gone through all of that suffering. Just imagine the pain and guilt those parents had to go through when their little girl was struggling to breathe. And they didn't know if she, was, she would be able to get a donor. And that's when it snapped. Um, I, also noticed, I also noticed this when I was discussing antinatalism with my peers. It started off as absurd, but the more you think about it, the more it starts to feel like a reality. It's, it starts to sound sensible. Uh, there's this one documentary on YouTube called uh, Children of Darkness, and I had to drag myself through it. Uh, it's about children with disabilities, and it's just rife of suffering um, that you, can't, you, can ha you can hardly stand it, man. And um, if you struggle to understand the antinatalist perspective, go and watch this documentary. It'll shake you to your core. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. It's that's one thing that I can't stand in life is children with with disabilities. Uh, okay, but let's extend this disability argument and say you want to have children, but you and your spouse know that you have a genetic condition that will let's say make your child disabled. Let's say being born in a vegetative state. Um, is it morally right for you to still have that child? Another similar case is um, from the book Escape from Camp 14, which I read a few weeks ago. Um, it's about this prisoner who was born in a concentration camp in North Korea. And he had a lot of resentment towards his parents for having a child um, in such conditions. Now, if you read the book, um, you'll understand exactly why he felt the way he felt. So I ask, are there circumstances where having a child is wrong? Now, obviously, I've cherry-picked um, some of the most extreme cases, and you can't always help your circumstances. But can we say with full confidence that procreation is always right? Okay, well, now you say, Richter, if life is so bad and full of suffering, why not just end it all? This, is, this question comes up a lot with antinatalists, and their answers vary. Some actually follow through with the suicidal thoughts. And uh, while others say we must distinguish between a life not worth starting and an already existing life, um, some argue that it would cause more suffering to end their life. Uh, like I said, there's a bunch of different answers to this question. To help us understand this position better, here are a few analogies. Okay? Imagine you want to go and see a movie. You book tickets far in advance, you cancel all your plans, you buy popcorn and drinks and sit down to watch. An hour into the movie, you realize it's terrible. You wasted your time and money. Now, what do you do? Well, most people don't just get up and leave. They already invested this much, so they might as well go through with it to the end. And when they get home, you know, your friend asks you, how was the movie? And you'd say, I wouldn't recommend it. Now, this is the antinatalist position on why they just don't unalive themselves, why they don't bring life into existence, because they wouldn't recommend it. 
Another good analogy is from the Shawshank Redemption movie. Spoiler warning. Um, people are in prison. Is prison nice? No. But some people stay so long that they get accustomed to the conditions. And when they finally leave, they want to go back. As crazy as that seems. Prison is life, according to antinatalist. These analogies show why antinatalists can't just end it. The whole thing boils down to the trade-off of suffering. David Benatar once explained um, antinatalism in a nutshell. He said, imagine you have a stick with, with magical powers. If you touch a rock with the stick, you make it conscious. The rock will think and dream and feel cold and warmth. It'll essentially become a sentient being. Now, he says, if we had a stick, we wouldn't go around tapping all the rocks we see, because by doing so, we would create sentient beings that can feel pain. So now we have a good grasp of what antinatalism is. But is it true? Well, I'd say it depends. More importantly, I don't think it's, it's a philosophy that will last or is viable in the long term. Remember earlier when I, when I mentioned evolution? Evolution doesn't select what is true. It selects what is useful. The gene that procreates and survives. The so-called antinatalist gene will go extinct and we will be left with a planet filled with increasingly eager breeders and procreators. In fact, let's say a million years from now, our brains might have evolved so much that even the idea of antinatalism will seem so crazy that we won't even be able to comprehend it. I'll leave you with one last idea. The antinatalist philosophy fundamentally says that life boils down to pleasure and pain. But I don't think that's entirely true. A fulfilling life, a life with meaning, isn't necessarily just a life filled with pleasure. I read one study that asked prisoners if they would press a button that would put them in a dream state where, the only, where they only felt pleasure. Now remember, they chose prisoners for a reason. Because even in this very pleasure-deprived environment, most of them said they wouldn't press the button. Now as paradoxical as this seems, there is something more to suffering than just pain. It's as if meaning is embedded within suffering. Life isn't just pleasure and pleasure and pain, but I think there is a third variable, you know, meaning. This is the gray area. This might be where the asymmetry breaks and one day we'll have to ask ourselves um, when we decide to procreate, are we giving new life the opportunity to experience life for all its glory or are we condemning it to a life of suffering? Thank you for watching everyone. Um, I really enjoy making these videos for you. Uh, if you liked it, leave a like and uh, subscribe if you want to see more. And uh, I hope to see you again.